go ahead and have a seat. Thank you, worship team. Uh, Annie, Todd, and Gideon, Lori, and Katie. Oh, June, sorry. That's not Katie. Thank you to my lovely bride for reminding me of that. Uh, before we get started today, I just want to uh, acknowledge we have a, uh, a flower placed here uh, as per our, uh, our custom here that uh, uh, we've placed a flower to remind us of somebody in our church who has, uh, or somebody close to members in our church who has passed away and uh, sometime late Friday night or early Saturday morning, Marie Chamberlain uh, passed away. Marie was Brian and Harold Chamberlain's mom, grandma to Josh, Jesse, Gideon, Camille, and Luke. And, uh, and so we don't, have visit, uh, sorry, we don't have all the details for visitation or funeral, but uh, we'll make them available as they're made available to us. So this is just a reminder to us to keep the Chamberlain family in our prayers uh, as they work through this, uh, I mean, obviously, this, uh, this difficult time. Uh, so on to today. Happy Father's Day to all you men out there. No hua, uh, no like dude grunt or anything like that, no? But not just to the fathers, to all the men out there, uh, to all the dads, to the mentors, to the father figures, to the friends. Uh, I hope you have a wonderful day today. I hope you enjoy a juicy cooked steak tonight. Anybody else? Just me? Oh, I'm winning this one. Um, I'm very grateful for the dad and the impact that he had in my life and uh, all the other men who have spoken to my life. Uh, sometimes it hurt when they did, but I needed it. They've encouraged me, they've pushed me, they've challenged me. Uh, they have allowed me to try something and fail, provided me the platform to get back up again. So to all the men out there, thank you for that. I was telling my father the other, sorry, my daughter, the other day that when we were young, we had only about 15 channels on the TV that we, that we, could, that we could view. And she just kind of rolled her eyes at me and said, okay, yeah, whatever, Dad, whatever. That got me thinking. Maybe my dad really did walk uphill to school both ways in three feet of snow. I didn't believe him, but he did. It's my attempt at a dad joke this morning. It didn't go over the way I was hoping. My apologies. Moving on. As a Father's Day gift, uh, we have did this for Mother's Day, and so we're doing something similar for Father's Day. We are increasingly looking to become a church that is more invested, more involved, and making an impact in our community. And so whether that is through our own initiatives or through community partnerships, Elmira Pentecostal Assembly, I believe will be marked by our love for Jesus and by our love for our community. So today as part of Father's Day, uh, I'm happy to say that in honor of our fathers and all the men at EPA, we will be making a $500 donation to a Waterloo-based nonprofit organization called the House of Friendship. Uh, this organization provides food, housing, addiction treatment, neighborhood support, and lots more to over 42,000 individuals each and every year in the Waterloo region. Uh, we have historic ties to the House of Friendship, uh, and specifically, more specifically through their men's shelter. We have volunteered there in the past. We're talking pre-COVID days here. Uh, and so when we contacted them to let them know our intentions, they were so excited and they wanted to do something very unique for, our, for the community that they served. And so they, uh, what they decided to do is that they would host a bit of a, what they call a summer fair uh, with a barbecue, drinks, popcorn, and lots of fun activities for the people who utilize their services. And they're, uh, in talking about it, they just said, you know, when, when life is really difficult for you, 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 you have, there is, it's, an event that is just that little extra to bring some joy into these people's lives because they haven't experienced it in so long. And so uh, this donation will also free up some much needed funding for a renovation project that the House of Friendship is undergoing right now. They're actually renovating an old hotel which will become their new men's shelter. Uh, I believe it's slated to be done, I think, September this year, but I could be wrong on that. Uh, but they'll have more space to house more people. They'll have an on-site medical clinic, uh, dedicated areas for uh, communal spaces, gatherings for group programs and different services that they offer, as well as spaces for intake, counseling, housing support, and things like that. And so that means so much to them, and we are excited to be able to partner with them. If you'd like to learn more about them, you can visit uh, www.houseoffriendship.org, uh, or there's a pamphlet in the back. You can pick up some information in the foyer after service. Here we go. We are continuing a series called, or entitled, 
witness, a discussion on evangelism. And there are some who ask, I remember somebody making a statement to me one time. They said, you know, it seems like Christians are always just trying to get people to believe in God or get people to go to church. And the truth is, yeah, you're, yeah, yeah, you're right. That's kind of a thing we do. I'm not going to apologize for that. And although it might be a bit of a criticism, it's a bit of a, not to critique it too much, but it's a bit of a misguided accusation. The truth is, is that we people, not just Christians, but people, we try to convince people all the time to think or do something that we've discovered, whether that's a new restaurant, a new show on Netflix, a hilarious video that we found on YouTube, whatever it might be, everyone everywhere is always trying to convince someone else of something new, trying to convince someone else that their way or their thing is better than the other person's thing. Evangelism, in a sense, then, is something that everybody does. We all do it, be it as Christians or promoters of a new trend that we've learned of. Most of the time, people are willing to, you know, quote-unquote, give it a shot. Somebody sends me a YouTube video, I'm probably clicking on it, why not? But with faith in Jesus, there's a lot of distaste out there. And a lot of it is fundamentally untrue. I'm going to apologize in advance if anyone is offended by this next little part, but I just think it speaks so highly. There was a comedian, although I'd use the term really loosely because I don't think he's that funny, but anyway. George Carlin was his name, and he had a lot to say about religion, mostly just Christianity, though. George was a very, like I said, was a critic, but he was also an influential voice to society that spoke to our society and has helped shape many of the modern views about faith. A quote from one of his bits goes like this, edited for church. Religion has actually convinced people that there's an invisible man living in the sky who watches everything you do every minute of every day, and the invisible man has a list of ten things he does not want you to do. And if you do any of these ten things, he has a special place full of fire and smoke and burning and torture and anguish where he'll send you to live and suffer and burn and choke and scream and cry forever and ever till the end of time. But he loves you. He loves you, and he needs your money. He always needs money. He's all perfect, all knowing, all wise, somehow just can't handle money. He goes on to say, when it comes to believing in God, I tried, I really, really tried. But the longer you live, the more you look around, you realize something is messed up. Again, edited for church. War, disease, death, destruction, hunger, filth, poverty, torture, crime, corruption, and the ice capades. He was a comedian. Something is definitely wrong. This is not good work. If this is the best God can do, I am not impressed. Again, my apologies if this offended anyone. But I would guess that if you ask the average Canadian their thoughts on religion, their thoughts on Christianity, you'd likely end up with very similar arguments. If God is so good, why do bad things happen? God is really just a moral policeman looking to punish us, isn't he? The church is just after our money and doesn't care about anything else. Of course, I don't agree with any of this, but I can't argue that at times this is an accurate representation of how we portray ourselves as Christians. However, anyone who is well acquainted with Christianity and the teachings of the Bible can quickly, easily point out all the errors, the deficiencies, the flat-out incorrect statements made. But why the discrepancy? Why do so many people misperceive what we believe? I'm going to propose that it might be just a little bit our fault. That we have historically majored on minor issues. That we've oversimplified what it means to be Christian, overcomplicated what it means to be a Christian even. And that we don't often know how to articulate what it truly means to be a follower of Christ. So we're going to look today at different methods, if you will, which we find through the Bible of how God accomplished his will of bringing people to faith. You ready for this? The first is what I'm calling cultural confrontation. There are times, absolutely, when we simply need to confront people with the truth of the matter. We often start with this in our society, though. But I'm going to propose that given the 
the current or average worldview of our society, that this always isn't the best place to begin. Though we must arrive there at some point. I'm going to read from Romans 5, 8 to 10. It'll be up on the screen, but I'll read it to you as well. And Paul writes this to the church in Rome. He says, But God shows his love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life. There absolutely comes a point when a person will need to be confronted with the reality that we humans are sinful, that we have become obsessed with doing things our own way, that we have neglected God in all that we say and do. And the only way out of that reality is by a complete change in how we do things through a total, complete, indelible submission to Jesus Christ. That's it. This is what salvation is. Nothing new to most of us. And when someone lives apart from that truth in this life, the choice has to be made to live apart from God for eternity. And it's not about ten things that we can't do, as George would point out. Even the Ten Commandments aren't even ten things that you shouldn't do. Some of them are things you should do. But it's a surrender over to God and his ways. And through Jesus and Jesus alone, yes, our sins are taken care of. We are forgiven. We are placed in right standing before God. The relationship between us and God is restored. The penalty has been paid. We're changed from the inside out. All of that. God, the creator of heaven and earth, and is now the one in charge of our lives. Reality, in a sense, is, well, this is how it was designed to be. But to tell someone that they can simply be forgiven of their sin when they don't, when when many people believe that, well, people are inherently good, well, it it doesn't answer a question that they're asking. It doesn't actually get to the heart of the matter of what's going on in their minds. We may be right in our statement, but we're coming at it from a different angle, from a wrong angle, maybe, at that moment. If we look at how this fits into one of Jesus' stories that he tells, he tells a story about a farmer who goes out and sows seeds. Some of the seeds fell on the path, and the birds came along and snatched them up. Some of the seeds fell on rocks, and they grew but were scorched by the sun, and they withered because they didn't have any roots. Some fell on thorns and weeds, and they got choked out by them. Some fell on good soil and produced a healthy crop. We can confront our culture with the truth of the gospel, with the truth of Jesus, when it's healthy soil. When they're ready to hear it. When they're able to trust our words and what we tell them. When someone is good soil, if you will, they'll take the message of Jesus and it will grow inside of them. God gives the growth. But that's when it will grow. But here's the thing. The news or truth isn't always the first thing to present. Or sorry, that news or truth isn't always the first thing to present. Because some people just aren't quite ready to hear that just yet. This notion is predicated on the likelihood that they believe in God, or at least have some sense of believing in God. And they're just unaware of maybe what that's all about. It's also predicated on the fact that they trust what you're saying. And that they believe that you really do care about their eternal well-being. So sometimes what we need to do is a little cultural apologetics. If we look into the ministry of Paul and how he spread the message of Jesus around a world that had little to no connection with the Jewish world, his ministry brings him eventually to a place called Athens, Greece. And as many of us know, many of the great philosophers of history uh, practiced and worked out their craft in Athens, Greece, many before Paul's time even. And so these philosophers are what Paul is working with. And these philosophical ideas and these thoughts, this is what Paul is trying to penetrate. And it takes him to a place called Mars Hill. And in Acts 17, it says this. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands, 
as though he needed anything, since he, gives, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything, and he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each of us, for, quote, in him we live and move and have our being, unquote. And as, sorry, as even some of your own poets have said, for we indeed are his offspring. Paul's ministry takes him to Athens, the home of these great Greek philosophers. If, chances are, if you've heard the name, this is where they practiced. And they probably spent some time in Athens discussing and debating with other great thinkers of that day. So Paul brings his ministry there. And he works there to try and persuade them toward the message of Jesus too. And the people before this, we don't read it, is the people there call him a babbler, which is a bit of an insult, actually. Uh, the word that they use, the wording carries this idea of a chicken pecking on the ground, just trying to find something that's food. They're insulting Paul and just saying, this guy's just saying a bunch of garbage and just trying to figure out, some, just trying to figure out what he even thinks. Brian Vickers wrote in his commentary on Acts, Paul weaves in physical and cultural surroundings religious and philosophical backgrounds, and his knowledge of Greek literature to build a seamless presentation of the one true God as both judge and redeemer of all people. Did you know that the lines, in him we live and move and have our being, is actually a quote from a hymn that they would sing to the Greek god Zeus? And then we find it in our Bibles. And that, for we indeed are his offspring, is a direct quote from a poet written by a Greek Stoic named Eratus some 350 or so years earlier. Notice here, Paul isn't just trying to take their religion and get them the rest of the way. This is not healthy soil. This is not good soil for him to be planting, if you will. He's not trying to get them the rest of their way on their theology with God. They don't really have any belief in what Paul is preaching. He uses the tomb of the unknown God. He uses his knowledge of their literature and their religion as his inroad to dismantle their beliefs and persuade them toward his. He's ultimately trying to convince people that they're wrong. But notice this. Notice how he's not doing it. He isn't calling them sinners in need of repentance. He doesn't use the word atonement or sacrifice. He doesn't read from the Torah. Or even talk about Jesus' miracles. One commentator even wrote this, that notice how Paul didn't even use Jesus' name. Likely because the second they would have heard a Hebrew name, Yeshua, which translated to, we translate Jesus, they may have just dismissed anything that he might have said after that. Instead, Paul tells them that, hey, there's this God, created everything, ruler of it all, and he'll judge the world, and he's doing that through one man. That's Jesus. And that man, he's brought back from the dead. Oh, now that's a cool story. And it's just the story of the Bible. Paul gets into their world. He gets into their headspace, and, and he gets into their way of thinking in order to present his own idea so that maybe, just maybe, somebody might want to listen just a little bit more. Again, if we look at how this fits into one of Jesus' stories, that he tells of a farmer going out to sow seeds. Some seeds fell on the path and the birds came and snatched them up. Some seeds fell on ground full of rocks and thorns. Sometimes it's the cares of the world. Sometimes it's other beliefs that people are attached to. And that's the reason that the message of Jesus doesn't take root. It does not mean, though, that the soil can't be cleared. The weeds and the thorns can be pulled, the rocks can be removed and put in a better place so that the ground can now give life and grow healthy plants. And may we as a church never get tired of preparing that ground to receive the message of Jesus. And finally, we get to this last method that I believe we are at in Canada today. We get to the ground now, we need an entirely different approach that looks, sounds, and feels much different than the two before. We need to begin looking at our own cultural influence in our society. And you're going to notice here that the biblical explanations start to get really long. And I believe this is really indicative to the time that it takes to roll out our influence within our own culture. 
So I'm not going to read the whole thing this morning, but we're going to kind of look at the story of Esther. The book of Esther is found in the Old Testament and is the only book that does not even mention God's name. However, to us readers, it is unmistakable to the reader that to conclude that God was intricately involved in the circumstances that surrounded the story. Esther was a young Jewish girl living in exile, and she was chosen to be the queen because the king, Ahasuerus, or Ahasuerus, was angry at his wife, essentially. So he called all the women into a sort of beauty pageant and said, the one I like the most will be my new queen. This young girl, Esther, comes along, and she's chosen by the king, basically because, well, she thought they, she was the best looking. So when Esther finds out that the king has this plan and he's ready to annihilate the Jewish people, he puts together a plan, or sorry, she puts together a plan that could mean certain death for her. But in the events leading up to it, she would proclaim a three-day fast, and according to Esther 5.1, it says, On the third day, Esther went in to see the king. And no one went in to see the king uninvited, by the way. Because the penalty was death even to his wife. And for those unaware, anytime you get to the Bible and it says something about on the third day, that's a bit of like Bible code, we'll call it. That's Bible code for God's up to something big. God's going to do something huge. And Esther reveals that the king's right-hand man has set out this plot to kill Esther's people, the Jewish people. And it's this incredible turnaround story. The people who were elevated in the king's court or now hung in the king's court, essentially. The people who were low are brought high. It is an incredible turnaround story of the intricate weaving of, of God in his story, in these people's lives. Esther uses her cultural influence to make big changes in society, to influence the king, to influence his decisions, rescues God's people from being slaughtered. All this from a young girl living in exile, away from her homeland, away from her culture, away from her religious beliefs, away from everything she's grown to know and love. Sounds a little bit like us in Canada, doesn't it? But Esther believed with her whole heart that God was at work even on foreign soil. Esther believed that even though this was a society that didn't want much to do with God, that God could still work through her, that God could still work in this culture. Lee Beach, in his book, The Church in Exile, wrote, the book, it's the book of Esther, is concerned to show how God's reign can become a reality through the faithful witness of a diasporic community whose trust is not in mechanisms of political power, but in the power of Yahweh, or in the power of God. Again, if we look at the story, how does this fit into Jesus' stories that he told? again, of the story of the farmer who went out to sow seeds. Some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and snatched them up. The path is where people walk, animals would walk. The ground is hard. Sometimes it was made of bricks and rocks put together. It's been used for anything but growing anything and probably for a long time. And no, nothing can grow there. What does this say to us? If the soil is that hard, we need to work to transform the soil so that we can sow the seeds. We need to look at how we can plow the ground, if you will, to get it ready for planting. We need to look at how our influence can shape where those seeds will land so that they can grow, so that the weeds and the thorns are not there, so that the soil is ready to take the seeds and can grow. I'm going to call the band back up as we kind of close off today. I've called this series a, a discussion on evangelism because it truly is a discussion. 
I'm not going to stand here and try to act like I have all the answers on this is how we reach our culture, our society. But I know this. That if our society was soil that we were trying to grow the gospel in, if you will, it's not ready to hear it. Our culture is so far removed from anything about God that it's hard ground. And it's going to take some hard plowing to try and dig it up, to try and get it ready. It doesn't mean that we neglect confronting people with the gospel message. It just means that maybe there's a little bit of work to do before we get started. The Bible by no means gives us an exact formula for the methods we are to use to reach our community, to reach our culture, other than go. Teach the world about Jesus. And God has given you and I a brain to think critically through the process of what it means to bring the message of Jesus to our world. And every situation and every person is a little bit different. Some people are ready to talk to you and will hear out what you have to say. Some people don't want to hear it. Does it mean that we treat them any differently? No. But we share God's love in practical ways verbally with people. We become the community that God wants us to be. Lee Beach continued to write in his, he said, the consistent practice of our faith will bring benefits to our world. Often this will be very subtle and won't draw any attention. At other times it may be more dramatic as our actions offer an overt critique as our actions offer an overt critique of the accepted behavior of our particular context. We can never be surprised when the world is living in sin because, hey, guess what's what? That's what the world does. But we also have to be very careful not to point the finger and say, oh, you world doing naughty things. Because we can point the finger right back at ourselves and say, ah, you know what, i got stuff that I've got to work through too. But I ask us this, how are we, how are you, but how are we, as Elmira Pentecostal Assembly, how are we transforming the soil around us to get it ready for planting? What difference does our church make in our society? Are we the church with the big yard across from Tim Hortons? Or are we that church that so many in our community can point to us and say, oh my goodness, if that church wasn't there, this wouldn't have happened in my life. They helped me with this. They were there for me when I... What difference does our church make in our society? Why would someone want to listen to our message? Why would someone want to hear what we have to say? Do we care enough about what other people have to say so that we can be part of a conversation with them? How can we make an impact now so that our message takes root later? I said it at the top, I want to be the church that is known by their love for Jesus and our love for the community. I want to make an impact in this community, through this church, with this church, so that anybody and everyone would listen to our message about Jesus. I don't want any stumbling blocks to be in the way. I don't want any rocks and thorns to be in the way of helping that grow in their lives. I 
want to remove it all. And sometimes that's going to take some work. It's going to take some work with how we present ourselves to our community. It's going to take some work on going through ourselves to get rid of the rocks and thorns that exist. But how are we, how are you transforming the soil around us to get it ready for the message of Jesus to take root? in people's lives. Poverty loses its grip. I invite you to stand Race can as we worship no and as we divide. ponder and as we think about our influence Whatever in the world. Your spirit is every dark darkness dies freedom is here with us burdens will fall like chains beauty will rise from the dust all that's lost will be regained you redeem you redeem you restore what's been stolen from me. You reclaim, you release, you rebuild with the words that you breathe. You redeem. Mercy will pour down like rain. Justice will come for the weak that were meant to defame will be crushed by the truth that you speak you redeem you redeem you restore what's been stolen from me you reclaim you release you rebuild with the words that you breathe you redeem. Miracles will happen. Healing will come. Plans of our enemies ruined, undone. Miracles will happen. Healing will come. Here in your presence, lost in your love. Miracles will happen. Healing will come, the plans of our enemy ruined, undone. Miracles will happen, healing will come, wrecked by your presence, I'm lost in your love. You redeem, you redeem, you restore what's been stolen from me. Reclaim, you release, you rebuild with the words that you breathe. You redeem, you redeem, let your revival awaken me. You reclaim, you release, you rebuild what's been broken in me. You redeem, you restore what's been stolen from me, you reclaim, you release, you rebuild with the words that you breathe, you redeem. Let's not forget in the middle of all of this that this is truly an act of God at work in our community in our hearts and in our lives. And that God will bring the restoration to our community while we're faithful to him. That God will bring restoration to people's hearts and people's lives as we continue to trust in him. I'm believing that God is looking for People who are ready 
to turn this world upside down. Are we ready to do that? Are we ready to allow God to use us in our church to do great things in our world, to do great things in our community? God, I thank you for this church. And God, I pray and I ask that you would move in and through us in a way that only you can. I pray that you would use Elmira Pentecostal Assembly to accomplish your will in our world. That, God, you would work through us, that we wouldn't look at barriers, we wouldn't look at anything that hinders us from moving forward, but, God, we would focus on you. and We would move forward with what you have for us, with the plans and the purposes that you have already prepared beforehand for us to do. Work through us, we ask, God. Help us to live in constant and total surrender to your will for our lives and for our church. And we'll be sure to give you absolutely all the praise and all the glory, all the honor for everything that you do. Thank you again, God, for speaking to us in this place. I pray that you go with us now. Lord, I pray a special blessing over the fathers here today. God, may you move in them. May you continue to work in and through them as a father figure, as a friend, as a mentor, as leaders in this community. I ask a blessing over all the, all the men in this room and all those watching online. We ask this all in the mighty name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen, amen. Now the strength of God sustain us and may the power of God preserve us. May the hands of God protect us. May the way of God direct us and may the love of God go with us today. Amen, everyone. Have a wonderful week. Happy Father's Day once again. God bless you all. We'll see you here next Sunday. Mm-hmm.